Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Fort Wayne Community School Board of Trustees. Um, we begin each meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if we would please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And roll call of members. Good evening, Steve Corona from the 5th District. Good evening, Glenna Yale, 2nd District. Tom Smith from the 3rd District. Ann Duff, member at large. Maria Norman, member at large. And I'm Julie Hollingsworth, elected from District 1. And also with us is the Clerk of the Board, Janet Doherty. Good evening. And our superintendent, Dr. Mark Daniel, welcome to your first Fort Wayne Community School Board meeting. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> um, okay, so we have no uh, awards and recognitions, and that um, uh, brings us... Oh, I, I forgot to mention, if uh, those of you who... And I think there's something paste, fo posted on the uh, Facebook page, but... You can watch this meeting on uh, a public access channel, Comcast 54, Frontier 24. You can watch it um, on the Fort Wayne Community School YouTube channel. Uh, evidently, uh, Facebook is down, um, uh, or our page is down, or something, or the connection is down, whatever. So um, hopefully you can join us on one of those other three. <coughs> So that brings us to the consent agenda, and those are items that um, come to us every week. They include the personnel report. They include the uh, minutes from our last meeting on June 22nd. They include vouchers and payroll uh, for the periods, uh, vouchers for the period ending July 13th and 27th and the payroll for the periods ending June 19th and July 3rd. And those vouchers, of course, are kept on file for? Seven years. Seven years? Okay. okay. Um, so, and members have seen all of these items. Do we have a motion and a second for yeah. the? Madam Chair, move approval of the consent agenda items, including the approval of minutes from our June 22nd meeting, vouchers and payroll, and the personnel report as presented to us. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, so, all those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. Mm -hmm. aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And Dr. Daniel, was there anything um, you wanted to um, mention or highlight on the personnel report? No, ma'am. Okay. I see we have 69 new teachers signed uh, uh, on the personnel report. I take that as a positive, um, <laughs> moving in the right direction. Okay. Okay, we have no old business, so that brings us to new business. And the first is, um, and by the way, if any of you want to volunteer to take any of these items so I don't have to do all the reading, <laughs> then um, step like right up to the up. plate because I kind of forgot to do that uh, before the meeting started. So the first is a K-12 insight contract. It's recommended that the board approve a renewal of our existing K-12 insight contract. The contract extension covers services related to Let's Talk, as well as our platform for survey implementation and analysis. This three-year contract total is for $392,490. The annual cost of the contract is $130,830 and that is funded by the peer grant. Um, the survey platform of K-12 Insight informs the work around professional learning, teacher evaluation, and the culture and climate of the district. Other support regarding survey platforms and analysis will continue as needed. Let's Talk is a way for the uh, school district to monitor the pulse of the community while giving parents, teachers, staff, students, and community members a 24-7 channel for ideas, questions, concerns, and praise. Let's Talk embodies our district's commitment 
to listening and responding with care. Through the Let's Talk platform, our district demonstrates authentic communication, which includes reading, reflecting on, and promptly responding to stakeholder input. This contract supports Fort Wayne Community Schools. Uh, goal two, engage parents and the community. Questions will be answered by Charles Kamick, Jr., the, uh, our Chief Operations Officer. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. second. Okay. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Tom. Questions? Just curious Mr. how many questions I guess we get, a, get a daily on Let's Talk. Three hundred. <coughs> well, Kristen informs me that lately it's been about three hundred. Wow, per day. Per day. Per day. Yeah, per day. Is it any particular area? Well, they want to know what's happening with return to school. Uh -huh. That's the biggest concern. Now, are you going to keep my child safe? Are you going to distribute the devices? So not non COVID. What do you think the <laughs> daily rate is? Probably closer to like fifty. Uh -huh. Thank you. Come on. How many surveys are built into this extension? Well, we usually do three, and then we have the option of doing others, quick surveys. Okay. And are those um, climate surveys or anything else? We do climate surveys. We do. Uh, the word escapes me now, but it's basically we, we survey our students, our parents, and our staff. Okay. This is coming to rescue me, I think. <laughs> I'm not talking well. No. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, in case people didn't hear, there were about Three, we've been averaging about three end comments per day? Yes. 300 okay. comments a day right now, three annual surveys. On average, we probably do about 50 inquiries, and that's across the district. But there's a lot of interest in what we're going to do, what Dr. Daniel was talking about tonight, which is our return plan. Right. Okay. Anything else? Okay, thanks, Charles. Okay, all those in favor of approval of this contract, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Anybody want to take Agile Mine? Sure. Okay. Thanks, Ann. It is recommended that the board approve an agreement with Agile Mine Educational Holdings, Inc., Porter Capital Corporation, to purchase a digital teaching and learning system for mathematics totaling $204,500. The Agilemine Accelerator Bundle will provide intensive math supports to prepare students for an accelerated pathway. The Agile Accelerator will supplement current curriculum to identify and address gaps and to increase mastery of standards for all middle school math students and students enrolled in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry. The agreement includes principal, teacher, and student resources, implementation supports, and ongoing intensive professional learning for coaches and teachers, along with the development of customized assessments aligned to Indiana standards. <coughs> this is year three of our implementation, and this contract is for the 2020-2021 school year. Agile Mind is the sole source provider for this teaching and learning system. The cost of the agreement will be paid from the general fund. This initiative is focused on improving student achievement and educator effectiveness and supports Fort Wayne Community School District Goal 1, achieve and maintain academic excellence. Questions will be answered by Joanne Philhauer, math, math coordinator, and Jennifer Mabel, curriculum assessment and instruction director. Okay, thanks. Do we have a motion and a second? Move for approval. Second. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Glenna. Um, questions? So is this designed for remote learning or for our classrooms or both? It can be used um, for both. So how is the Agile Mind Accelerator different than just Agile Mind? 
Are, I mean, we, are we adding something to what we had before? Is this something different? That I'm not 100% sure. Um, I can find that information out for you. That's a good question, and I can share that with you tomorrow. Okay. And where are we on um, um, professional development for uh, using this product? So since we've started using it, we've had uh, representatives as well as Joanne Philhauer out to our our buildings, our secondary buildings, on a regular basis, there has have been opportunities for teachers to observe someone utilize um, Agile Minds in the classroom, as well as um, someone to su support coaching and uh, of teachers utilizing the tool as well. So um, teachers have had ongoing professional learning in their building. So right, but what about this summer? No, not this summer. There okay. wasn't any professional learning. I guess that's why I was wondering if this accelerator was a, something new, you know, if it was add-on, mm -hmm. then that's what a good kind question. of, yeah. So um, I will find that out for you this, this um, tomorrow morning, and okay. then I'll get back with you on that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tracy. Will, will the, uh, Tracy, will this help our students get caught up who missed out on part of last year because of, we had to shut down? It can support um, some of that. We've also um, used, we're also looking at some other tools to help support um, closing some of those gaps in student knowledge and skills. And that's another reason why um, we're working diligently to um, provide the professional learning for NWEA because it will let us know what um, potential gaps in student knowledge and skill is. So then we start at the grade level content, but then we can scaffold up to make sure that we're meeting individual student need. So we're using all of those tools, Agile Mind, Dreambox, um, NWEA, all of the tools that we have to support closing those gaps that may have occurred as a result of not having um, additional instruction from last spring. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving uh, this Agile Mind contract signify by saying aye. 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 Purchase. I'll take the next Opposed? two. Opposed? And we're back. Okay, so Tom, you're going to take the special education grants? I'll take the next two. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. It is recommended that the board approve the acceptance of a special education grants from the Indiana Department of Education for the school year 2021. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or called IDEA, from 2004, requires that after the base payment allocations are provided, additional funding is awarded to each district based on public and private school enrollments and according to the number of private school enrollments within the local school jurisdiction. The number of children living in poverty, that is the National School Lunch Act participants, also are also included in the calculation. Funds are used to support salaries and approximate and fringes of approximately 130 staff members. These non-competitive -co grants are in addition to the special education fund payment. For Fort Wayne Community Schools, the Part B special education grant amount for the year 20 school year 2021 is eight million eight hundred seventy five thousand four hundred and six dollars this is an increase of three hundred and one thousand and five hundred twenty six dollars from last year the preschool education grant is for three hundred and twelve eight hundred forty eight hundred eighty four dollars and that is an increase of two thousand one hundred and seventy nine dollars from last year these non-competitive grants are managed by Nikki Sprunger Director of the Department of Special Education, and it supports our goal number one, achieve and maintain academic excellence. Questions will be answered by Nikki Sprunger. Okay, thanks, Tom. Do we have a motion and a second? Move for approval. Second. Okay. Thanks, Glenna. Thanks, Maria. Um, any questions? Okay. All those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.
So yes. now, Tom, you got Park Center case manager, managers for elementary emotional disabilities All program. Right. It is recommended that the board approve the contract to provide case managers in our elementary programs for students with emotional disabilities for $180,000. <clears throat> Since the inception of our elementary emotional disabilities program in the 2011-2012 school year, we have been able to consistently increase the number of ED students remaining in their assigned schools. The review of the 2012-19 and 20 data shows that 98% of the students remained in their assigned buildings. The contract with Park Center provides each of our ED elementary programs a case manager during the school day to support Fort Wayne Community School staff and students' behavioral needs in these 12 classrooms. The program's funding is being supported by a medical and federal grant 611 Part B and will be overseen again by Nikki Sprunger, Director of Special Education, and this supports our goal of achieving and maintaining academic excellence. These questions will be answered by Jennifer Burning. Okay, do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Tom. Questions? Okay, all those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Maria, you've got uh, Verizon MiFi. Is that at MiFi? MiFi? Okay, thanks, <laughs> Jack. Keeping me <laughs> squared away. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, it is recommended that the board approve the purchase of 9,000 MiFi cellular hotspots from Verizon Wireless of Annapolis Junction, Maryland for. Uh, $1,349,910. There will also be an additional monthly service cost of $148,410. The MiFi's will be assigned to students who do not have internet access at home for remote learning. Parents apply for the MiFi's through the MyFWCS portal or at their school during drive through registration. The MiFi's will be configured so only FWCS devices can connect to them. Discussions were held with other internet providers, however Verizon Wireless offered the best solution that limits connections to FWCS devices and provides better mobility. Fort Wayne Community Schools has applied for the GEAR Governor's Emergency Education Relief Grant to support this project. In case other funds are required, we will propose the use of CARES Act, E-S-S-E-R, which is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funding. And Jack Bird, um, Director of Technology, is here to answer any questions. Okay, do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Glenna. Questions? Jack, uh, a month or so ago, you, you used a phrase that captured my attention. You talked about anytime, anywhere learning. And with this, are we there? Yes. This, this will provide uh, one of the biggest gaps that we had to face, and that was students not having internet access at home. So this will provide them with that connectivity. Verizon signal in our school district is strong and reaches all, all points? Um, as best as any other uh, cellular carrier, I will not, I did not walk every spot though. <laughs> so I, would, I wouldn't want you to. <laughs> uh, so it's about $9 a month for the service. That's a pretty good deal if, if my math is correct. It's sixteen forty nine uh, per month per hotspot. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that nine months or 12 months? That is Do we 12 pay months. That? Okay. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. Oh, the the $148,000, that's a per month charge. Right. And we can keep that active as long as we need to. So if we want to continue through the summer, we have that option. If we decide that we want to pull those back in uh, at the end of school, we have that option. Okay. Do I understand it correctly how these work so that, like, if I, if 
if I want to go to my grandmother's house and work on my homework and take my uh, iPad or my laptop, I, I just take that um, I I just take that MiFi with me. Correct. And plug it in. Or it's supposed to be charged. I don't know how it works, but anyways. Yeah, as long as it's charged. As long as it's it charged, then supply. it'll provide yes. my device with internet access. Correct. Awesome. Okay. That's yes. so cool. This is very impressive. It is impressive, and and we, uh, in our discussions with you before, I think the big reason that we settled on this was security. Yes. Right. That was one it, of the big reasons. That, yes. Yes. It will. It will not power. Uh, or provide access for every device in the home, Correct. it will also prov only provide access for Fort Wayne Community School issued um, devices. Yes. And then we rely on our security that we have on those devices. Correct. That way, if they take the device to a non FWCS connection, it's still filtered. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So how i don't know the technological term but how much power does this have can i'm i know that the students have to stream video youtube and things like that for a lot of their learning so will this so yeah our tests right now have uh come up with about 10 megabits which is sufficient uh do to do a zoom you need about two megabits okay uh, to do that so we found that there is sufficient bandwidth now that all depends on your cellular signal of course um, so if you're so, in a weak cellular area, you might not get uh, 10 megabits. Okay. So if you go northern Indiana or something, the signal might not be as strong. Correct. <laughs> this recommendation is for 9,000 of these MiFi's. Um, have we, through the registrations, have we? do we have a number yet with regard to how many families are in need of the MiFi's? The only number I have right now are the people that completed the registration online. Mm -hmm. um, I do, we are processing the paper forms. In fact, as I speak, we have people entering those forms into the system. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, I have 3,900 that have applied mm -hmm. online. And have we taken delivery of these MiFi devices already? Uh, we have not, but they are in a warehouse uh, from Verizon. Okay. How did we do on the computers we did loan out to some of our junior, our seniors last year? Do we get them all back, and do we have a way of ensuring that when we distribute distribute all this equipment, we can retrieve it? We have not retrieved all of the computers from this past um, year. Uh, we're about 20 that, that are still out there. Uh, some of those students are coming back to us, so, uh, and we've been in contact with their homes uh, to, you know, get the device back. And then, you know, we, you know, we will treat this um, in talking with uh, Kathy Friend very similar to the way we treat our textbooks. If we have textbooks that are not returned, we can issue a accounts receivable for that. So a bill, we would bill the family yes. if they kept the computer? Correct. And would we be billing at the full rate that we paid for them or would they be reduced? Uh, we would look at the any depreciation. Okay. 20 out of how many? <laughs> uh, we uh, delivered 418. Hmm. Okay, so we got most of them back. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Um, there was something I was going to ask you. Oh, yeah. Uh, do am I? How how many days of drive-through registration are there left? I think today was it. And this is not really a question for you, Jack. But oh, <laughs> we have we have two more. Days. Two, oh, more? two more days. Okay. Two, Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes. Okay. So for all those people out there watching, if you have not, you know, if you, this is something that you're um, interested in, um, I know there are some questions from parents about whether they should go through drive-through registration or not. Um, some people are like me. They like to do things in person. Um, they like to fill out forms. Um, you know, they like to go old school. <laughs> so if that's true, then you want to, you can go through drive-through registration um, tomorrow, or they could go to the face center. That's the only place they can go. Oh, that's the only place you can. Yes, starting at two o'clock tomorrow, and at eight o'clock 
uh, on Wednesday. So two to eight tomorrow. Two, two, two to six tomorrow, and then eight to noon on um, Wednesday. You want to step up the microphone, Faye, and talk about that? We, we're trying to provide options in the morning and in the afternoon. Okay. Today we were open from 8 until noon. Tomorrow will be 2 to 6, and then tomorrow or Wednesday will be 8 to noon again. Okay. Yeah. But that's? Just at face. They can go to the schools by appointment, but if they want to do a drive-through, that's only at face. Oh. We had it at the schools Thursday gotcha. and Friday of last week. Okay. And then this week it was Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay. Okay, so that, those hours this week at FACE. Yes. Okay. So, Jack, does this give us the capability? It, should we have to shut down the school due to an outbreak uh, or another wave or something for all our students to do online learning? Yes. Great. That's good news. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for all of your work on this, um, Jack. I know that uh, you and your staff have done a lot of work, done a lot of research, probably done a lot of uh, testing of uh, equipment, but this is just going to be a great thing for our students. Thank you. Like you said, anytime, anywhere learning. Thank you. So thank you. Okay, so all those in favor of approving the uh, purchase of the 9,000 uh, MiFi hotspots, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And Maria, you've got the Lenovo power supplies. Fabulous. It is recommended that the board approve the purchase of 5,000 power supplies for student Lenovo 11E laptops from Prosys of Indianapolis for $180,550. These power supplies, in addition to the existing power supplies, allow students to take home power supplies while still leaving a sufficient number at school for at-school charging. We will, uh, we will propose the use of CARES Act ESSER elementary and secondary school emergency relief funding, and Jack is still here to answer any questions. Okay, do we have a motion and a second? Move for approval. Second. Okay, thanks, Glenna. Thanks, Tom. Any questions? So, so just to, just to clarify, we're going to give kids a bag, and then they'll have a device, yes. and then they'll have a charger cord, and all that'll fit in the bag. Yes. And then I suppose they can leave the MiFi at home if they're if they need one. They can, and it has a power supply as well. Okay, that has a power supply as well. Okay, I was looking them up on the <laughs> on Amazon today. <laughs> Gonna get one. Well, <laughs> thinking about it. Okay. Any any other questions? Okay. All those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, now we have a bid recommendation for copy paper. Um, it's recommended that an award be made to the lowest responsible and responsive bidder meeting specifications and quality standards. Uh, the company is the Paper Corporation. The location is Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, the total is $181,247.65. This bid is for a supply of copy paper to be stocked in the warehouse. The largest portion of the bid is for 7,560 cases of 8.5 by 11 white paper. All schools and central administrative units are served by the supply. A comparison of prices by item is on file in purchasing services and may be reviewed upon request. The prices of the recommended bidder reflect a 12.18% decrease when compared to the last bid that was opened in June of 2019. Um, invitations to bid were sent to 16 prospective bidders with 10 not responding. Uh, Liberty Paper, Los Angeles, and Midland Paper in Wheeling, Illinois did not meet the bid specifications. So you can see uh, below in the um, uh, recommendation that there are eight um, 
bidders and there are their bids and the paper corporation from Des Moines, Iowa was the lowest. Um, questions will be addressed by Director of Purchasing Services, Rod Rathke. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Maria. Questions? Rod, I'm curious. So last year, we shut down physical school in on March 16th? 13th. 15th? 13th. 13th? Sounds right. Oh, okay. The well, 16th was the first day we didn't have school. Seems like right. two years ago. Nah, but. nah. <laughs> um, but of course, we did a lot of printing of packets. So I'm just curious, did we use more paper than usual last year, less, or about the same? Uh, we actually used less. Even with all the printing of the packets, we used uh, quite a bit less than the overall volume because we normally would be ordering somewhere around probably 9,000 cases okay. on our normal year. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Rod. Okay, all those in favor of approving this uh, bid, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carried. Now we have an emergency project. It's recommended that the board declare an emergency for the following project and allocate funds from the emergency allocation within the capital projects fund. Uh, so, and this is at the nutrition center, um, the replacement of a refrigeration rack compressor and associated repairs for $43,775. Um, the work is related to the existing refrigeration rack at the nutrition services processing center. Um, rack compressor number three, discharge valve failed, and the refrigeration rack lost the liquid refrigerant charge, causing irreparable damage to the compressor. This emergency request is for the material and equipment cost associated with lost refrigerant, refrigeration compressor, and other system component replacements required to complete the repair. Uh, labor costs are covered under our current preventative maintenance service contract. So questions will be answered uh, or will be addressed by Director of Facilities, Darren Hess. We have a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Steve. Questions? Okay. All those in favor of declaring an emergency for the following project, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <laughs> Uh, now we have a change order for the renovation of Price Elementary School. It's recommended that the board approve the following change order. Um, uh, at Price Elementary School, the contractor is Schinkel Construction, Inc. The original contract amount is $6,658,000, and the addition that we are being asked to approve is $467,400, which is just a tad over 7% increase. Uh, the original contract for the renovation of price includes the overall building renovation. At the time of the contract award, a conservative approach was taken in accepting alter uh, alt alternates in order to ensure that the overall program would fall within budget. So there were two alternates uh, totaling the 467400 uh, one to add a separate parent pickup lane and rubber flooring in the corridors, which were not accepted um, originally. So it's now recommended that we accept these alternates and fund, and it is funded with the 2016 um, School Basic Renewal Restoration and Safety Project, or the uh, 2016 bond. And questions will be addressed by Director of Facilities, Darren Hess. We have a motion and a second. So move. Second. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Maria. So, Darren, it's a good thing, right? Um, so, we we uh, yes, estimate that we have enough money left that we can accept that uh, with in our projected budget that we can accept these two extra. Bids. Correct. So, we're finishing up Northrop High School, for example, uh, here next week. I noticed that uh, it looks first, great out in front, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, finally cleaned Everything up Everything removed yeah. and the uh, property graded and... 
Um, so that was our largest liability still left out there, and we feel very confident that with the program savings now we can move forward and, and pick up some of these alternates we held back. Great. And did I notice the um, temporary classrooms are also gone at um, Northrop? Correct. It's uh, now repaved and ready for teachers next week. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. So, Darren, where will will this parent pickup lane come off state? Um, um, it actually, right now, they currently have, uh, they come down Rosemont and Stoop and pick up along the street. Okay. So, which backs up the whole neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, just further south, we picked up years ago, uh, I believe, five properties yeah. mm -hmm. um, off of um, Huffman. Mm -hmm. So, it'll enter in and off of Huffman. Okay. Which will completely separate it from our buses and from our uh, parking, which is our, our, our ideal situation. So we'll enter from Huffman and exit somewhere else, or the the entrance and exit will bo both be off of Huffman. Okay. It'll be a a loop. Okay. Okay. Great. I'm glad. Uh, I'm sure Price will be glad to get that. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. All those in favor of approval um, of the change order, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now we have the uh, 2019 extracurricular account equipment uh, purchases. It's recommended that the attached report of equipment purchases be officially accepted by the board. Equipment purchases, including equipment reconditioning, over $500 from extracurricular funds are subject to approval by the Board of School Trustees. The State Board of Accounts has agreed that these purchases and reconditioning may be accepted annually. Um, attaches to the report uh, submitted by Fort Wayne Community School Unit has for 2019. Questions will be addressed by Chief Financial Officer uh, Kathy Friend. So do we have a motion and a second? Move for approval. Second. Thanks, Glenna. Thanks, Ann. So, Kathy, uh, this report looks a little light as compared to years past. Is that why, I, why uh, because we were shut down, there are probably um, not a lot of... No, because this was for calendar year 2019. So oh, this, that's true. Yeah. Um, so but we, I guess I just remember in the past this being like at least a couple pages long. Um, you know, there are some times when we get, if we get large sums of money from um, a donor, it, you typically over 5000 we put it in our district um, donation account and gotcha. spend it from there. This is just things that were spent right out By of the, the extracurricular account. Right. Correct. And you would have approved those other kind of purchases through the vouchers. Right. So this right. is just giving you approval for things that were not on the voucher list. Right. I see. Right. Okay. Still. It's light. <laughs> just curious. Yeah. No, it does seem lighter. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we went through every single extracurricular account to make yeah. sure um, that we picked everything up. So. Oh, no problem. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It does look lighter. Yep. There's okay. Some, some Any other pretty questions? impressive items on this on this list. Um, I, I notice. Uh, We're not. That's the next. Zero Bradley donation. That's the next one. That's the next, oh, yeah, that's one. The next one. This is something separate. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is how they may have spent that money, Steve. <laughs> Never mind. The next. You're right. The next I, list is. Sorry. Very impressive. I see it. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, all those in favor of uh, approving the uh, report, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, next we have the report of 2019 gifts, grants, and donations. Recommended that the attached list of gifts, grants, and donations be officially accepted by the board. Throughout the school year, various schools receive gifts and donations from individuals, organizations, and businesses. Authorization to receive gifts is a board function. The State Board of Accounts has agreed that a listing of all gifts received during any one year and ratified by the board would meet the audit requirements. Attached is a long listing of gifts, grants, and donations uh, as submitted by various Fort Wayne Community School unit heads for 2019. A detailed report is on file in the business office. Unit heads are encouraged to express appropriate appreciation for any and all gifts received. 
Uh, questions again will be addressed by Chief Financial Officer Kathy Friend. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Questions? Comments? So I can now sing the praises. I, I see I moved from the ukulele rack in the last recommendation <laughs> to, to the backpacks that were donated by looks like Pine Hills Church and then Vera Bradley to a couple of schools and then the Hefner Foundation gave us over a hundred grand for the uh, I think the baseball facility at Northrop. So some really nice contributions there. But everyone is every every donation is appreciated. And it's not and it's not just corporations, but churches and parents mm -hmm. and PTAs right. and um, it's nice to know that people are so fond of our schools and and we do have that uh, community support. And I think I added up the uh, roughly uh, because the um, be instrumental uh, music program through the Fort Wayne Community School uh, Foundation is on here that purchases instruments um, for um, our middle schools and last year over sixty thousand dollars in instruments were purchased for our middle schools wow. um, that's awesome but you're right Steve this is um, you know this is an awesome uh, list where you know not we're thankful to our community um, and all the organizations within our community um, for the support. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving the uh, um, gifts, grants, and donations for 2019 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, next we have um, a custodial services agreement. It's recommended that an award be made to renew our custodial services agreement with Sedexo Services of Indiana Limited Partnership, uh, Woodland Park, Colorado, for one year, uh, commencing July 19, 2020. Terms of the original agreement from 2010 allow for service adjustments and price adjustments for renewal years to compensate for inflation. The one year renewal amount is $9,035,051.59. And Kathy Friend, Chief Financial Officer, is still here to answer any questions. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tom. Questions? Got to believe they've been working overtime to get our buildings ready for the first day whenever yeah. that happens, hopefully a schedule. But, um, and I assume that they're going to be extra busy during the year, and we've taken that into consideration with extent with this extension. Um, one of the things that we added in this contract was some evening supervision um, for that very reason to make sure that our buildings are um, clean um, when the students arrive back the next day. So um, I, I think that's that's one of the uh, new things in this contract, um, and. Um, to say the that that's the main big thing in terms of service change would be those that additional supervision that they're going to provide but all in all they're you know they're they're providing us really good service with the with the 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 contract that we have yeah um and they have they have um been very receptive to supporting us in any way that we need them to and um so hats off to them they're they're doing a great job they I'm sure they're like a lot of organizations and could use additional staffing just because um, of the times that we're in. So I'll put a plug in for them. I know that um, they could actually, you know, hire additional staff that would that would fit into their um, existing program. So if you know anyone that needs a position, um, <laughs> tell them to contact Sodexo. Okay. <laughs> and this comes out of the operations fund, correct? Yes, it does. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, all those in favor of uh, approving the uh, um, this agreement signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, now we have um, board action regarding the fourth district board member. <coughs> it's recommended that the board appoint a candidate to complete the term of Jordan Levimoff. 
uh, the board member representing the 4th District. This term expires December 31st, 2022. On June 16th, the board advertised it was taking applications from Fort Wayne Community School District 4 residents to fill Jordan Levimoff's uh, empty seat. When the application period ended on June 30th, there were 10 applicants who met the qualifications must reside in District 4 for at least one year, be registered to vote in District 4, and be at least 21 years old. On July 8th, the board met an executive session as allowed by law and selected four candidates for consideration for the seat. On Tuesday, July 14th, the board met in public session to interview Ms. Raleigh Booker, Ms. Janae Johnson, Ms. Holly Munoz, and Ms. Alicia Peggins. At this time, um, the board will uh, accept uh, nominations from members for appointment to the District 4 seat. Each person nominated will be voted upon by the board in the order of nomination. And four yes votes are required to appoint a nominee. Madam President. So do we have, do we have a uh, motion and a second to uh, begin the appointment process? I move that we yeah. open the appointment process. Okay. Second. Okay. Okay, so now we're open for nominations. Uh, Madam President, I would like to nominate Ms. Janae Johnson to fill the fourth district seat. Okay. I would like to nominate Raleigh Booker. Um, she is a Fort Community School graduate. She attended Von Schweizer Park Memorial Park and is a <coughs> Southside graduate. She has three kids uh, in the district that go to Arlington. She has experience in working with a diverse population. She worked at a community <coughs> center in Indianapolis and understands the needs of our district. Um, she has been following the issues in education and um, understands that we are underfunded due to vouchers and charters and those types of things. Uh, I think she understands the dynamic of working on a board um, understands that the board speaks with one voice and um, she also has um, she lives in the fourth yet yet or sends her kids to Arlington so she has um, knows a lot of people you know not just in her district but around for uh, other districts in Fort and community school um, I think her, her she as her, or she's self-employed so she has a flexible schedule where um, she can attend our meetings I've, and I also thought she was very genuine and personable um, she came well prepared for her interview and she gave thoughtful answers and was very well spoken okay any comments regarding Janae Johnson sure I, um, I'm impressed with I, I like both candidates that have been nominated I? Um, um, Raleigh's assets um, as a parent and um, some of her work experiences. Um, I, I like Janae, um, another graduate from Southside High School. Um, she, has, um, she has experience as a former substitute teacher with us. Uh, happened to know that she was highly sought um, when she uh, worked for us. Everybody wanted her to be in their classroom. Um, she also has more recent experience with us through her employment with Junior Achievement. Prior, prior to working for Junior Achievement, she was a volunteer in our classrooms. And I know I've heard from several parents who worked with her and were impressed with her. Um, but um, she uh, then took a paid position with JA as a consultant to develop uh, educational material but videos that were used during our remote learning uh, period beginning in March. And I know that um, because of her in-classroom experience that what she was delivering, the product that she was providing was well received. Um, I like her because she um, has experience on a community board, at least one. I know the Three Rivers uh, Festival Board and so um, I, I like that um, and understanding, I think, with that experience, um, how boards operate with uh, paid staff. So 
for that and other reasons, I, I'm just impressed with her. But again, I, I think both candidates are, are good bets for us. Okay. Um, I think uh, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. You don't necessarily have to comment, but just, just to be clear. Um, and so uh, Janae Johnson was um, nominated first. So we'll vote uh, yes or no on Janae. I will vote for Janae. Okay. No. I'm sorry? No. No. Yes for Janae. No for Janae. No for Janae. What'd you say? No. No. Uh-oh. <laughs> Are you gonna vote? You really did it to me, didn't you? <laughs> Um, I'm going to vote yes for Janae. So now we move. So we do not have a uh, fourth district board member yet. So now we move on to Raleigh Booker. Vote yes or no. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. No. Wait a minute. No. Yes, no, yes. Yes. so it's the same thing, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> What'd you vote? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I'm gonna vote no. So now um, we need to um, Let's hear some comments and see if we can, you know, I, I'm going to have to say that um, I was very impressed with all four people that we nominated. Um, I do believe that any of the four for their various reasons could be an asset to the board. So um, I could probably be convinced one way or the other. Um, I was impressed with um, Janae. Uh, because of her previous um, board experience. Um, I was impressed with her uh, uh, personality um, and her, uh, you know, I, I mean, and, and like uh, Raleigh, she was, uh, she was uh, brought up in the 4th District and still lives in the 4th District and both were uh, graduates of Southside High School. Um, but I felt that as far as experience being on a board, um, Janae was, um, that that would be um, an advantage. Um, so I, uh, uh, let's, go, let's go from left to right now because I've said something, Steve said something, so Maria. Um, I would like to just add about Raleigh. Um, as um, a cur the only board member that's a current parent, um, I thought that it was really important to have that parent perspective on the board. Um, not that you all, I know that some of you are recent FWCS parents, not to, you know, <laughs> you know, not to say anything bad, um, but I think that it would be good to have a voice, another voice of a parent on the board. Um, and I don't think that the fact um, that Raleigh hasn't served on a board before put her at any deficit. I don't think I had any concept <laughs> of what I was walking into. And I think that I caught on fairly quickly. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I, um, that would be, and not, and not to say I would be fine with Janae as well, um, but if I put the two together, I like the fact that Raleigh is a current parent. And, and that's exactly what I was going to add, Maria, was that, you know, I no longer have any kids in school, and, I, and you are the only one left who has a kid at school, and it does make a difference. I mean, I feel like I know new no I'm not going to know anything that's going on no but you know I just I just um, understood what was going on as a parent um, and and can work with parents because I had a kid I had a kid in this in the district so I think that that helps and her kids are young three at Arlington um, 
I just think having a, another parent on our school board would be a definite benefit. Tom, any comment? Well, uh, one of the things that I thought was just the most important asset that Janae would bring, not just the board, but the school system and the entire community, is her experience with junior achievement. We have spent a lot of time at this board talking about careers for our students who are coming out of school. She fits right into that. I don't know if anybody else even comes close because I do believe that career development is one of our key responsibilities. We've talked about it time and time again at this board. And that's why I think she is the best candidate. She also has a very strong personality. She had the strongest personality of all the candidates. She was powerful in her speaking. And I agree with what Julie said. All the candidates were great. But for me, it was her strong personality. I think she showed great leadership qualities just in the way she spoke and addressed this board. And again, she brings that skill, that ability to know about career development. To me, that is the most important thing, and that's why I support Janae. Glenna? Well, <clears throat> both of the candidates that it's come down to are very um, well qualified and would be an asset to this board. But <clears throat> the main reason I was personally drawn to Raleigh uh, Booker was one, her passion. She spends so much of her time in her community uh, reaching out and working with young people and I just really felt she would be a very articulate voice for uh, that um, that district, which uh, again, both of them would represent the, the district well. But because of her involvement in the level that she's involved in with um, all these different organizations in her community and with the youth, her experience in mental health and other, and social work would give us an added insight and window into the needs of that community and for that reason I the, I would continue to support her nomination any other comments yes um, as I looked at these two individuals um, here, here's how um, I measured their experiences and, and talent um, Raleigh, to me, has had a, a good career as a manager, not as a leader, that I see more in Janae's experiences. Managers do things right. Leaders do the right thing. And the experiences that Raleigh had was as a manager in an Indianapolis community center. Um, in visiting both individuals' Facebook pages, I, I really didn't see a lot of information from Raleigh about education or other issues. Um, I think the advantage that Maria came into this was that um, she was immersed in public education. Uh, she was working on her master's degree. She was very fluent in all the issues of the day. And very clearly, that was an easy vote for us. Um, I, I see Janae more, in spite of the fact that Janae is not a parent, She's actually closer to our district than Raleigh is. Um, I, I talked to Raleigh's principal, um, said, yeah, she's in our building and, and, is, and participates. But, uh, but above and beyond that, I don't see any additional community engagement in Fort Wayne. Raleigh's engagement was in Indianapolis when she was employed at a community center in working with youth. Um, and so, um, you know, I just don't see that connection with Fort Wayne Community Schools on her side. Um, and that's what I see with respect to uh, Janae's experience, not only through junior achievement, 
um, but with her work at uh, Whitney Young and also um, in an English class at the Ellen County Juvenile Correction Center. So I believe that she has a, a greater understanding of the issues um, facing our school district, and that's why I support her. Okay. So, Revo, unless there are any more comments? Okay, so um, Janae Johnson. Yes. Glenna? No. Yes, for Janae. No. 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 So I'll vote. I guess it doesn't matter how I vote. <laughs> I just realized that. Irrelevant. So I'll abstain. So uh, that brings us to uh, Raleigh Booker. Um, Steve? No. Yes for Raleigh. No for Raleigh. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, for those of you who don't uh, understand that if we fail to um, reach an agreement at this board meeting, then that decision goes to the judge of the circuit. superior circuit court. Circuit court. Judge Tom County Dalt. Circuit Court or whatever. Okay. Um, so. Is there a time frame? I believe. Yes, thirty days. There's thirty days from the time. Yeah, frame. and we're we're coming up on up. we're coming up on that. Yeah. So. I do not want this decision. I want this to be a board decision, so I vote yes. So you voted. So Raleigh. yes. So Raleigh Raleigh Booker is the board person. Raleigh Booker, uh, by a four to two margin, is appointed to the district four um, seat. Okay. Congratulations. And yes, like I said before. Um, all four of the uh, people that we nominated, um, In, I think, yeah. were, were uh, we were lucky, I believe, yes. uh, to see not only the interest that we got um, from the 4th District, but the candidates that we got from the 4th District. Well, mm -hmm. uh, congratulations to Raleigh, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, we achieved our ultimate goal of filling Jordan's spot mm -hmm. with a person, a black person, um, and frosting on the cake, a Southside graduate, Jordan would be awfully proud of that. Jordan would that, be, that yes. an archer is going to succeed him in his chair. Yep. <laughs> Got to have a Southside person to needle the uh, Northside uh, superintendent the, graduate. Right. And, and speaking for myself, um, she's a little bit younger than me. Uh, youth was is. another factor. She's not on Social Security, <laughs> so hopefully she's going to be around for a while. Hopefully. Any other comments? No. Okay, so um, that brings us to the uh, close of the business um, end of our meeting. Um, and so uh, we have a report from Superintendent Mark Daniel, uh, who will provide an update on the Fort Wayne Community School uh, reentry plan. And board members have a uh, uh, printout of the uh, presentation in your packet. So, Dr. Daniel. All right, well, thank you, Madam President and Buckle up because this is going to be a bit of a presentation, but it shows you the complexity of this issue. This reentry plan is constantly evolving. We wanted to do such because we're responding to what's happening in regards to our health and safety um, concerns. Of course, those are changing daily across our state as well as what's happening locally, which I believe it's going to be a local decision more than a statewide decision. So we're very much in tune to what's happening. And we have, again, I, I'm just gonna tell you the, 
the chiefs and the other staff that have been part of this discussion, it's been extremely uh, pleasing to see their expertise as well as how they're collaborating together to come to these, to these uh, shall we say, recommendations. But I'll say again, these are very difficult decisions because it seems as every time we open up or come to one conclusion, it opens the box for another particular item. So with that said, um, one of the things, and I think Chris is going to be very pleased, hopefully she'll see a reduction of those 300 questions on a daily basis <laughs> because people truly want to know July 29th is coming. And with July 29th, we've asked them to decide, are they going to, are they going to be in person or are they going to be remote as far as their children? Parents are asking, what does it look like? How does school start? When does school start? Now move that to teachers, and teachers are absolutely um, on the edge of their seat wondering, are you really going to start school? When are you going to start school? How are you going to support our professional development? How are you going to make our buildings safe? And as you saw on that, that first slide, there's a, there's a list of things that were being discussed. So. To let you know, we have weekly discussions with our uh, FWA leadership. Those discussions are both with um, the president as well as teachers on their board, um, as well as our Uniserve director. We also are meeting with them bi-weekly, and that's through the traditional method, and that's led by Charles. So therefore, teacher input is is, uh, should I say, it is being included in these, not just discussions, but in our decision making. And I want to tell them thank you for this input. We need it because this is a decision that we alone aren't making. Ultimately, yes, someone has to decide. But I feel very comfortable receiving this information and us processing it. So with that said, um, the start of school which is, as you know, we were originally to start school on Monday, August 10th for students. We have decided to move that to Thursday, August 13th, and here's some of the reasons why. We already have built into our calendar those three days, one in March, one in April, and one in May, that we would use to make up those snow days. We do not see the need for those snow days with the fact that we finally have one-to-one. -one. You've heard of all the great technology advancements we have for our students. We will have connectivity. We will have one-to-one. -one. We can have N if we've been truly practicing and implementing remote learning. We are, um, I, I will say, it is truly learning going forward truly learning with, with standards being addressed. It's not, are we trying to maintain? So we're moving forward with learning of the standards. Very important for that to happen. Also, it's not impacting the end of the calendar. So it's still May 25th. By the way, what are we doing prior to that time, prior to August 13th? Well, we originally had in our calendar August 6th for the starting uh, with teachers returning for their professional development. That will still remain. So August 6th and August 7th, we will still have those days for teacher training, as well as principal leadership um, being involved in that. We'll then have a weekend. And I know teachers are saying, okay, I'm dying to figure out how to do unit lesson plans in regards to remote learning. Well, they'll have that information on the 6th and 7th, then they go for their weekend break if they want to continue that, because we'll start again on that Monday. So on the 10th, we'll also have professional development primarily geared towards remote learning and how to uh, teach in this, say that using that modality. Now, it falls almost hand in hand with what we've been doing in regards to deep learning. So that's how do you bring the, again, the curriculum to life? How do you utilize technology to drive that? How do you, if you will, as some of you know, use blended learning? How do you use flipping of classrooms and so forth? We are, we, we truly think we've set that stage. 
Now, even tomorrow and Wednesday, our um, QIT teams, which is quality improvement teams, are meeting. They're meeting in each of their buildings. Those are teacher leaders with building leaders, principals and assistant principals and so forth. They'll be going through these phases as well because we think the best professional development is from the ground up in using teachers as part of those, as part of, of, of uh, should we say, educating each other and peers helping peers. So, very excited about that piece. You're going to hear more of that information, though, from various chiefs as well as um, Ramona. Now, let's go to the next slide. Hey, Mark, let me just ask because I know sure. teacher, teachers are, you know, uh, watching too. So they always want to know, you know, am I going to be able to use those other two days to, you know, get my classroom ready? get my remote learning uh, work ready, meet with my colleagues in my department, that kind of thing. Yes, so we are honoring those last, should we say the two days prior to the students arriving, we're right. honoring those days. We would like to see those used as they have been in the past. So teachers will have a chance to have their time to set up the rooms and so forth, plus principals will need to spend time specifically addressing what's going on in their building. Right. Now you can imagine that QIT team, they're going to be um, individualizing their safety plans in their buildings because each building's unique. Let's work on that. We're, we're uh, steering them towards that way as well as how do we figure out remote learning. Okay. So. Cool. Will we go then on in those days in March, April, and May? No, we'll not. We'll oh, not. excuse me, excuse me. Those days in March, April and May will now be regular attendance days, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, just to also, this needs to be explained too. We're using some grant dollars to provide the extra days of training and it's based on an hourly rate per our contract. So we are using some grant dollars, not general fund dollars, to cover this cost of the additional hours of training for, again, at the beginning of the year. So, very pleased with that. Um, and we'll, again, those other days are already accounted for. So again, no additional dollars in regards to regular salary, but some additional dollars in regards to training. Okay, so what does return to learn mean? Well, elementary students, as we know, they can attend in person five days a week or parents may choose a five-day remote, remote learning um, uh, modality, if you will, or presentation of, of learning. Middle and high school students will still be thinking of the two or three days a week, and you read there, and that's alternating every other Wednesday. Um, or parents may choose five-day remote learning. Key, though, is parents, please, please respond by July 29th. We need that data because that data starts to do what? It starts us in the whole cycle of how are we going to allocate teachers in both the in-person learning or face-to-face -face learning or remote learning. And we're seeing that evolve as well. So very, very important for that to happen. We also believe this. So the next slide. We also believe that... We need a range or a window for people to experience this, parents and students, and allowing there to be flexibility from if they say, for example, if they've chosen to go remote, maybe in that first three weeks they decide that's not best for the family or for the student, we'll then allow those students to return to in person or face to face. We feel that's very, very important. Um, and you can see the various options we have there. Um, we think that if they want to, again, if they want to make that decision even before the three week uh, deadline, that's okay. We'll move them. That might even be a benefit for us because we won't have a, a large number at that date of September 3rd. But we also say this, traditionally the district has said if you're going to move from one building to another, you change something in regards, we need a week to sort through that with transportation. So please give us a week to do that. And it's sort of nice because it falls around that Labor Day time, so it gives us some extra time. 
So give us a week to do that. But once that three weeks time is there, we want students to remain in their uh, remote learning environment for the full semester. So again, trying to create consistency in what we do. Could okay, a, a question. Quick question. You said that they will remain in that, that um, mode of learning for the full semester. For the full semester. And that's regardless of if we get out of phase no, five and no. everything is open back up? If everything's open back up, we'll, we're trying to look at that probably every, you know, see what the trends are every two to three weeks. Our goal would always be return full time. Okay. One to one. I just wanted to ch yep. verify that. That's the, you. we know that's the best mode of learning. Of course, but I yep. just wanted to make sure that's not yep. written in cement. Somewhere. Not written in cement. Okay, good. We're flexible. Because it even begs to the question what happens after the holidays? <laughs> what happens there? And I'll tell you why that's important because you're going to see some of what our discussion is. We need students both in the remote world and the face-to-face -face world to be very similar in their progression of the uh, sequence or I call it curriculum mapping. So we don't have students here and the students here because hopefully we do return to full in-person learning, face-to-face -face learning, and if that would happen at the end of the semester, we want people to be very close on that mapping. Okay, so any questions on the start date and the return to learn as far as the choices and the three week window of they can try it. If they don't see it's working, they have a choice to, to have uh, go back to that other, whatever their best, what they think is best for their child. I like that grace period. I like okay. That. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we go to some safeguards and you read that, Tom? You can't read that, but uh, you've seen it before. Basically, it's what was established um, when we started bringing back people. I want to say it was in April. But we've added a few things, but it's very similar. We're reminding people this, these are the conditions we want our buildings to be in. These are things, wearing masks, yeah, wearing masks you need to have, and so on and so forth. This is out there, by the way. We'll have all this on our website. Excuse me. But it's key to know we have gone through this. We continue to modify this as we're having to adjust based on the health department, both county and state. Are we following our mask mandate or the state mask? Uh, we are following our mandate. We are saying all students and staff will wear masks. Okay. And we're, I, I, um, I think that's also what our county health department is highly recommending, but no one's going to come out and say, you will. We are saying, you will. We have the face masks. We're going to utilize them. We have the shields for the teachers. We're going to utilize them as the teachers want to. But mask is the essential piece of, uh, essential PPE. Is so, that, even though the governor has recommended that, uh, kids in second grade and below do not need to wear masks because they're not susceptible. As not as susceptible. And we have said for standards for across the board, K through, and someone's going to correct me, pre-K? <laughs> Pre-K through 12, we're saying mask up. Now, there are differences, you're right, between a kindergartner and even a fifth grader. And we have to be aware of, there are times when these kids have to do this. And we'll do that based on the parameters of safe distancing and using outdoor teaching, outdoor times for recess and those things. But again, for practice for all, face up, face mask um, or mask up as, as the term the governor's been using, mask up. And we'll continue that throughout. And in, there are different sizes for our little ones. Our little ones are using child children sizes. They're not adult sizes. So um, and we'll see how that goes. And uh, it's going to be a learning for all of us. OK, learning environment. So Tracy, why don't you come up and one other question. The microphone Just, um, uh, all of our uh, drinking fountains are going to be turned off, correct? Yes. We have yes. So all drinking fountains are turned off, but we do have water dispensers for uh, bottles, 
and those will be students bringing in their own water bottles to okay. fill. But um, that's especially important. You're going to see that in another part of the presentation. Okay, okay. What about masks for teachers? I think you mentioned something. Teachers will be given shields, but they'll provide their own masks. So if they want to, by the way, students can personalize their mask. They can wear a mask from home as well, if they so choose. Um, it will follow the dress code just like anything else. But um, they're allowed to do that as well. So teachers bring your own mask because we probably will see these being um, something like what we're wearing so they can reuse them. Um, if they don't have it for the day though, we have again disposable masks that we're handing students on buses as they come if they don't have them but in the buildings as well they'll have access to those. So supply your own mask and every teacher gets a face shield. The shields, is it She'll talk about okay, the shields. Thank you. On the safety for our teachers, are we talking at all about the prophylactic use of hydroxychloroquine, which is supposed to be a very great uh, preventative for catching? Because some of our teachers are vulnerable. Yep. And that in conjunction with zinc has been very effective for doctors and other professionals on the front lines. So I think we're responsible for giving drugs to any of our teachers right. for any reason whatsoever. Right. So again, that would be through the health department, what they had recommended, and they'd have to go through a personal physician. However, I know that our um, uh, Mary Hess, our, our nurse director, director of nursing, she is right there with the health department. And again, we can't tell them or stu we can at least give them information as far as what's happening and again that would be through our local county health department okay so where they're where they are that day okay tracy learning environment and this is important only because we want to have some common vocabulary and definitions mm -hmm. as far as what is traditional learning and so on and so forth so i would like for her to do that and she's going to speak to those items we do have also some, uh, as we look at elementary and secondary, what does that mean? Do we have sample lesson plans? And if you want to take it from there, thank okay. you. So good evening. Um, I wanted to share with you this evening um, the three learning environments that we as a district have um, landed on. Um, and these are academic, but I, I also want to stress how important the social emotional learning is. And Faye and her team have been working diligently to collaboratively with the academic to make sure we address both the social and no, social and emotional learning environment as well as the academic environment. But right now I must specifically talk about um, our three different learning environments being our traditional learning environment where um, we will um, this year um, use more digital resources as well as hands-on textbooks and things in the classroom. And that will be in our traditional um, school environment. Then we have our blended learning, which um, will provide, again, use of digital and hands-on because our students will come to school and have face-to-face -face instruction as well as being provided off-site instruction. And then our third uh, remote learning um, strategy will employ digital content um, to provide off-site instruction to students who, and families who make that choice. So our face-to-face, -face, again, is, is, the, is the same as it's normally been. Kids will follow their traditional schedule. Um, they, again, we're going to ensure by using our digital resources, whether access to textbooks, that kids practice at school how to access those things at the LMS. So when we have, say, a snow day or um, a student is sick at, at home, they can take, have their device and they can access the learning from home. Um, our remote learning provides, again, for uh, off-site instruction. Um, one of the things that the state has identified is that for uh, K through five, six, actually, no, five, grade five, students need to be engaged in learning for five hours, and for grades six through 12, they need to be engaged in teacher-directed learning for six hours. And so they will access and use our um, LMS system daily. Um, we've had discussions about students having to log into each course by period. 
Um, they will participate in asynchronous and synchronous lessons and learning activities, and they will um, have access to digital resources and assessments because we're working with NWEA now to assess our students uh, remotely. They have that option. So back to that slide. Yes, ma'am. So the five to six hours, mm -hmm. does that mean they're going to, what they do at home is going to be five to six hours a day? They, so the state is saying guided, engaged and guided, instruction guided by a teacher. So that doesn't mean they have to be on the computer for five or six hours. It means that they need to be working academically. So say they're doing a research project, especially for our upper our high school secondary students, they could be engaged in a science, uh, a research project or a science experiment. And maybe they need to upload something to the LMS to prove, to show that their teachers what they've engaged in. So there's some kind of activities that they're going to be engaged in. They could be doing um, independent reading, independent writing, doing math. So they can be engaged in a variety of learning experiences, not just um, watching a video of a teacher teaching a lesson. So it's five to six hours of their time, but it's not five to six hours sitting at the computer. Correct. And there, so the other question becomes, so what does that look like um, <coughs> for um, a, t a student and teachers at school? Because one of the challenges we're working through is what does that look like for a teacher? You know, um, we want to make sure that students have the ability to access their teachers if they've chosen the remote learning option. So we're working through some of the logistics in the buildings and get and her team will be working with them to make sure uh, teachers have a schedule where students can connect with them on a regular basis. Uh, Tracy, what is the asynchronous versus a synchronous lesson? Does, are these kids going to be required to log into a class along with a bunch of other kids at the same time or will they be uh, a recording of some sort that they just log in and access when they're ready. Both of those. Both. So you, so you could. <laughs> good question, though. It's a very good it's question. A great, great, awesome question. So they will be able to um, teachers for students who participate in the remote learning. They can log in and their teacher at a certain time and their teacher present a lesson live to them. That is that is one of the options. The other option is sometimes the teacher will record something and have it posted or post a video of something and have them watch it and then respond to it. So so, both. so if I am at home, do I have to have the nine to four or what eight to three shift or can I do the, do can I work from two to seven PM? Are you if you're a student? Yeah. Yes. Um, that's a part of the work that we're doing collaboratively with the Office of School Leadership because buildings, sometimes a teacher may be teaching one group of kids and may need to um, have another period where they're doing remote teaching. So I may teach, say, three periods a day and may write with kids in front of me and then I may have to do some remote learning. Those are some of the, I want to call it details. Um, that we're in the process of, of working out. And we do have um, currently, in one of the, the next couple of slides, we have model schedules that we can provide for um, buildings. And we also have model lessons that we can provide for teachers to help support them. So help to, just to add, teachers have a contract time. Therefore, you need to honor that contract time. So. I think there's something about having a framework. It's something about having structure. So therefore, if you are a remote student, and say you're a high school student, 9.30, do we start at 9.05 or something? 9.05-ish, yeah. <laughs> whenever the, the day starts, that's period one. Mm -hmm. And you need to have your availability, you need to be plugged into that course. Then you can imagine you have, in a high school setting, you have another teacher. That second period. So they are following the periods of the day. Now. You and I know there are a lot of ways to do things and they could maybe even, um, I'll just say, they will have remote access hopefully to lessons, but if you want access to that teacher directly, you need to be during those time slots. Mm -hmm. And that's the flexibility uh, of being able to have at home instruction, but we do need to have it in a structured way. So that's where we're leaning, um, talking with our teachers. I think they're leaning that way. 
as well. But you also heard the word recorded lessons. So we are wanting to record lessons. We think that's best. Um, not when they're doing synchronous lessons to record them. Um, I.e., I'm, I'm a remote teacher. I may be doing, I'm teaching strictly remote. But I'm not teaching to those students in front of me as well. We want those two separated. So therefore, uh, pre-record. And I'll just use algebra as an example. I have an algebra department. Today I'm going to record lesson one. Actually, I'm going to record it prior to the first day of school because on day one we need that going to the group one students and group two students. Now, they're going to hear it via recording and work on it. They can ask questions. Hopefully, we're going to work this through through some type of Zoom or what have you where they can contact their teacher for that period. But again, it's that sequencing of events, pre-recorded, we're actually creating, if you will, a virtual lab. So uh, excited about this, excited about working with the teachers on this and developing a system that's going to generate these lessons and at the same time um, make it doable for our teachers. Make it doable for our teachers. So, all right, any questions on that piece? So other than maybe a teacher doing a Zoom with kids or some sort of, um, you know, with the class. We're not going to be live streaming classrooms. We're not going to be live streaming classrooms. Remote teachers could be, for instance, hey, I, I, I have this, uh, um, again, here's the video on this. If they want to, they potentially could. You have to be careful, though, because as you Zoom, many things... We're talking about all the, uh, what are our ethics of Zooming? What are our protocols of Zooming? Appropriate protocols. That's probably the first couple of days of school, by the way. How do you remote? Mm -hmm. What are the guidelines? Uh, David's probably thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to write another handbook on just <laughs> what are the ethics of Zooming. But again, these are all new areas for us, but we, we know this is, this is how we're going to have to deliver instruction. So um, we also, though, are aware of how much risk do we present to um, FWCS, how much risk do we present to the other students. We have to be aware of that as well. Right. So that's why we're having to be, I will say, and you'll hear me say this, we're having to be pretty tight on that. Um, we can't be too loose on the protocol piece. Um, just because we have to start tight and then we'll see if we can loosen up. Um, go ahead, sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, and then the, the third method, our learning environment, is our blended, which is a combination of face-to-face -face instruction and off-site remote learning. Again, when students are not at school, they do need to still be engaged and it becomes essential that they log into the LMS because that's how we count instructional days. So. Um, I know some young people, my, my son in, included, thought that on certain days he didn't have to log in. And I said, yes, you have to log in because they don't know if you're doing your activities and your work. And again, we're going to utilize um, asynchronous and synch synchronous learning and um, activities. And then um, again, our, our blended learning kids will also access the and utilize the management system, digital resources, and they'll have the, the option of doing hands-on because they'll have time in school so they can do some, some lab work and whatnot. Next slide, please. So we do have choices um, for, uh, we have a, a draft schedule for what uh, remote learning will look like and we provided guidance. We will provide guidance for teachers on what that time can be look like. And so um, our curriculum department and technology departments are working to design that professional learning right now. Next. Same with this uh, secondary choice. We have a, a, a draft uh, schedule for blended learning as well as a draft schedule for remote learning as well as model lesson plans because we know this is a significant shift for our teachers so they will have access to these examples as well when we can provide our professional learning uh, in August. Next. 
The next area is our special populations, specifically our English language learners. In this case, um, we do have to screen our students to identify students who um, may uh, be eligible for uh, language uh, development services. And so um, we'll follow their um, IOPs and then our ELL teachers will work collaboratively with the regular content area teachers to ensure that our students have the language acquisition instruction necessary to be successful in the blended learning model or the remote learning model. Next. The other area is our um, students with disabilities. Um, case conferences will need to be um, scheduled um, and they can be done via phone similar to what we did back in the spring but we need to make sure that we determine supports and, and related services that may need to result as a result of the t a blended model or remote model um, of learning that parents may choose. I will say, I'll reiterate, <clears throat> the traditional learning is recommended for our students identified with a severe or moderate disability. Um, so uh, teachers, I mean teachers, parents who have questions or concerns um, they will be able to reach out to their teacher of record who can provide them with some guidance. And then our special ed teachers will work, will work collaboratively with our gen ed teachers to make sure um, that students get the support when appropriate for <coughs> traditional content areas. So that's um, all of what I have right now. I know there's a lot of questions um, regarding special populations and Krista, as they work to have the FAQ out, um, we're responding to a lot of the questions that parents are having. Any questions? Yeah, so how will this fall, as far as the remote learning goes, how will it be different from what went on last spring? Uh, good question. Um, one is the expectation. So first and foremost, all of our students this time will have access to a device and have co connectivity. So that was one of the barriers we had last spring was that we did not distribute as a district devices to ensure that our students can access. The other piece is that um, we, all of our teachers, um, re regardless of special ed, ELL, general education teachers will all have LMS pages. Students will be able to access content by, via the LMS. And so they can, they can turn in assignments, whatever, that's a lot different than what we had last spring. Last spring it was, um, everyone didn't have a device and that was our biggest obstacle. Also <laughs> attendance and grades are now happening. Yes. So there's your, uh, if you will, Expensive. the accountability piece there as well. Mm -hmm. And if we see attendance that, that is waning, it follows the attendance policies that we currently have. So whether you're remote or in person, we expect attendance. So that's a that's a huge difference. As well as it is now content moving forward. You're going to be mastering new standards. So it's very much school like we've had in the past. It's just delivered in a different way. Mm -hmm. So um, there's the huge difference. Now that now that we have the equipment and the tools available and you're going to hear from Ramona next and also the teacher training component. So before we go to Ramona though, I just, I think it's, yeah. Notice we're recommending that students with severe or moderate disabilities attend daily. That's because those students are in um, smaller class sizes where we can do distancing. So we think that's important. We know it's very difficult to provide those services remotely, so we can do that. Um, I, I will say always that a parent has a choice, but it's something that has to go through the IEP process because that is a truly a contract for the student, and that can't be modified unless we've gone through that process of IEP. So uh, with that said, how we distribute these, uh, all of our computer devices and so on. That is, uh, Jack has a plan here and I'll say that he's been unbelievable in his coming up with uh, recommendations. I would like to see us move something on this timeline but we're open to, to suggestions. You can see here and you can ask Jack questions. 
Um, we start the distribution the first day students arrive. So that's what we're thinking. Um, we have discussed how can you do it earlier than that, um, and we'll continue that discussion. But we are prioritizing with students who are remote, um, they need to have those devices ASAP. So, um, you know, we're going to do our best to get those to every one of our kids by the 18th. If we try to use some other systems, other methods, uh, we're open to that. So if there are people out there listening to us right now that have some other suggestions, we're willing to think about that. But some of the parameters that, Jack, that you were working around were we have limited staffing. That's a huge piece. And when you're trying to distribute 30,000 devices, we have to record each device being <coughs> distributed to each student. So that's a lot of hands-on. And we're thinking it will be best within each building. So, Jack, I think you have centered it on each building distribution versus one and all come to a drive-through and try to do it that way. Now, we have thought about drive-throughs at each building, and perhaps we can work through that. But that is a limitation we have, and we understand that and we're working to do it. But I did want to share that with, with everyone. We're trying to overcome this obstacle. Um, so every kid has a device, but do, am I going to have that device with me at school, and especially at the secondary, and take it from room to room? Or do they have classroom I don't, devices still? or what? So this is now they'll have with them. So elementary is already within the same room, so that's but now you're talking really secondary world. So 6 through 12, they'll be carrying their devices. They have bags for those devices, especially designed to handle the, should we say, the um, uh, concussion of uh, students <laughs> dropping and so forth. So they're specially designed for that. And, but they will take them from room to room. Now, part of the safety phenomenon will be how do we keep cohorts together? That's a, going to be interesting to see if some of our middle school uh, principals can create that. So maybe the teachers move and not the students, that sort of thing. But we won't know about that until they sit down with their QIT groups and work through some of these. I don't see how that's going to happen in the high school, though. They'll, they will most likely carry that with them. Again, much of the curriculum is now delivered digitally, so if we have digital textbooks, they're being they're to be used. And we know there are some textbooks or consumable items that that's hard copy. They're going to carry those books and they'll have those as well. But primarily we're trying to stick with digital formats. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're to Ramona. Ramona Coleman is going to talk about professional learning and what's been happening in that space the last several weeks. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you to our Dr. Daniel and Cabinet for giving me this opportunity to share where we've been on our journey with deep learning. Uh, I did not include a slide tonight. Um, I basically want to say that I'm the one that's facilitating this message. But we do have a deep learning, I've shared that with the board before, a deep learning communications team that's made up of directors at the secondary and elementary uh, level from the Office of School Leadership, uh, the director of special education, director of curriculum, uh, managers from uh, FACE, uh, especially in the area of counseling in the area of our um, social emotional alternative programming. I was trying to think of Liz alternative programming. And then again, of course, for me and my department, along with the coordinators for professional learning. Right. So our work started really July 6th and 7th for this year, framing the stage again for deep learning for the 2021 school year. We had a stop gap when we left in March moving forward with deep learning and the professional learning that we had planned for the remainder of the school year. So in order to ensure we knew, as far as moving forward, how we would plan and facilitate deep learning for the school year, we actually developed a deep learning self-assessment tool to use with teachers. 
Teachers took that self-assessment tool around clarity, depth, and sustainability. We had of the teachers surveyed, about 80% of those teachers identified clarity as the face of implementation that we were. So what did that truly mean to us as a district is that we had clarity around teachers throughout the district understanding and having a common language in regards to the six C's and the four elements of deep learning. But we wanted to ensure what capacity tools were we developing and what capacity tools we were providing with teachers throughout the district in order to ensure that we were moving from the clarity stage to the depth stage. So the first learning community that we brought together was our learning community of coaches. And that learning community took place on July 6th and 7th with the support of new pedagogies for deep learning and PDL and their capacity building, uh, global capacity builders. And so with that, Janet, next slide, please. So with the facilitation with coaches, we wanted to make sure again that we went back to give them a look through the lens of deep learning, the clarity of learning goals around the six C's, how we would infuse the precision of pedagogy with the four elements, and definitely involving or engaging in that collaborative inquiry circle around the school conditions that's necessary for deep learning, the district conditions that's necessary, and the system conditions. When we think about system conditions in FWCS, it really comes back to that equity hypothesis. So we know that deep learning is great for all students. However, when I think about the information that's been shared tonight, even with the information that Tracy just finished sharing, we know that deep learning is especially it is especially informing for students that we look at that have gaps in their learning. So when we look at the plan that we had in place last year with the remote learning that we had for students, we know that this plan moving forward and the expectations will ensure that we have that equity hypothesis of making sure that all students are learning at all times. And that again with our curriculum that we're infusing the elements of deep learning with our six C's and the four elements. With the professional learning that we provided with coaches, it was key because we know that our coaches are key communicators for us in shaping the learning in their building environment and especially in collaboration with their principals. So the new pedagogies for deep learning modeled with coaches gave them protocols and tools that they would collaborate with their principals and getting ready for the onset of school and then bringing together their quality improvement teams that Dr. Daniel spoke of earlier that will take place tomorrow and Wednesday in their buildings. Next slide, please. So you did this uh, three days in early July? We did July 6th and 7th just with coaches. Okay. And then basically what we wanted was is that we wanted to make sure that we were building capacity with coaches in the building so everything that we're doing tomorrow and Wednesday with our quality improvement teams, we really set the stage and frame that learning with our coaches first. So for those two, those two days, the 6th and the 7th, were you able to get any feedback, evaluation from, from those uh, coaches there? As yes. Well? So the feedback they, that we they tell you? The feedback that we have for coaches is that this really gave them the frame and the stage for moving forward for the 2021 school year. The first question that we always get from coaches is, do our principals know about this? <laughs> have you talked to our principals about this? Have our principals totally bought into this? So you're asking us to do something that we want to make sure that principals have been given a roadmap. And so basically we had to ensure coaches that the information that we were sharing with them would be the same exact information that we would be sharing with principals and with their quality improvement teams on the 28th and 29th okay. for them to take that key message back to the building. That's tomorrow and Wednesday? Yes. Okay. And again, tomorrow and Wednesday, that's NPDL, the Global Capacity Builders. They will be facilitating the learning with coaches and QIT teams tomorrow. So again, we look back. I just wanted to share again. Um, every time I look at this slide, I know left to right, but I kind of seem to start right to left with it to say first who's involved. And so again, definitely board and cabinet. We know that we've made sure with the MPDL team that we've had Dr. Fullen and the uh, new pedagogists for deep learning to meet with the board. The DL core team is the team that I spoke of earlier that really ensures as we're planning with 
new pedagogies for deep learning that we have a map for how we want deep learning to be implemented throughout the district. That involves our school leaders, our coaches in QIT. Uh, this past Friday, we had leadership for all, which all administrators throughout the district with the readiness to learn component. Again, we had Dr. Jean Clinton, uh, who the board and the community have heard before to make sure that connectedness piece, that before we push directly into knowing that we, I'm sorry, that we know that the standards and that content is really important to our teachers and to our students and our parents in the community. However, Jean Clinton really focused on that readiness piece of making sure that we're building a culture and making sure that first before we approach the academic side of the pyramid, that we made sure that we were looking at the readiness and that social emotional learning component to make sure that all staff felt safe, that you were building that culture that everyone felt like their voice was being heard and the well-being was being taken care of with everyone. Curriculum collaborators, we did not meet this past summer, but again, we know that deep learning is infused. And again, just making sure that the community knows that deep learning is definitely a foundation or frame that our superintendent, Dr. Daniel and cabinet really sees and the board uh, sees as an entity that helps us to reach all students in Fort Wayne Community Schools. With QIT, with coaches, continuing with principals, we will continue to design and assess deep learning. That was one of the things, again, uh, board and cabinet had asked for. How are we monitoring or assessing the impact of deep learning and FWCS? And that was really the purpose and the primary purpose of us creating the deep learning self-assessment tool so that we could see exactly where we were as a staff and that we could really personalize and be really precise about the deep learning and the support that we were providing the buildings. With the support of the new pedagogies for deep learning, we're going to take each one of those phases that I shared with you earlier. When we look at the clarity, the depth, and sustainability stage, we will create modules in collaboration with MPDL to say if we have building A that still needs more work around clarity, we will have modules that they can use that's just around the clarity phase of deep learning. Building B may feel like I have a group of teachers that's still with clarity, but we're kind of ready to move into that depth stage of deep learning, and there'll be modules available for them also. So again, always practicing in that collaborative inquiry stance, uh, leading the culture of deep learning. So we're going to talk more about teachers, those teachers as activators, teachers as collaborators, and teachers building that culture of learning. The principal learning team protocol goes along with our deep learning visit. Uh, this past Friday when we did our uh, virtual webinar with all of leadership, one of the questions was how would we do that? How do you plan for us to do a learning walk if it's virtual or if we would go into a total remote stance? So again, that's part of the focus of us, of us modeling for leadership and for others, how that would look in a virtual world. And so again, um, in regards to Jack and the technology team and being more specific about the professional learning around how we're using Zoom or how we're using other digital platforms and how we can use those uh, digital platforms and still have those learning visits to occur. So Tracy, uh, on several slides talked about asynchronous and synchronous learning. So again, um, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning shared with us a white paper that they had uh, completed in, co in coordination with uh, Microsoft. And so with that, I want to make sure that these are definitions or research-based definitions that when we look at asynchronous and synchronous learning, we want to make sure that in our stance, we model the same thing for adults. So we know that in asynchronous learning, students are working independently and we're facilitating professional learning. We want to make sure that we're modeling for adults how to engage in asynchronous and synchronous learning. Tomorrow during QIT, the synchronous learning, of course, would be the audio visual during the Zoom that new pedagogies for deep learning will be in that virtual space. With the asynchronous learning, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning Global Capacity Builders will step away and they will give QIT team members along with their principal and with the role of leadership. They will work independently in the building based upon the PL, the strategies, 
the information, the tools that has been facilitated synchronously with new pedagogies for deep learning. So we want to make sure not just for students, but we're modeling for adults how that would look in a virtual environment when they're working with their students. Also, we're trying to model for principals as they work continuously throughout the year and other district administrators, how that would look for them when they're not bringing administrators or adults together face to face, how that synchronous and asynchronous learning uh, would be, uh, how they would engage and develop that. So again, I talked about coaches earlier, and we know that for our coaches, our building coaches and district coaches play a vital role in the work that we wanted to be done throughout the district. So again, with our Capacity Building Institute, July 6th and 7th, we made sure that we went back to review really the clarifying the purpose of the work with coaches together. We wanted to make sure the norms that we talked about previously, how do we set norms just like we set norms for any professional learning face-to-face -face, that we want to make sure what norms are we adhering to when we're looking at norms in a virtual world the organizing of the learning sessions. And then this was really key, the blue with the check mark, because the <laughs> Capacity Building Institute truly was around understanding and facilitating protocols for QIT. The ending product would be, how do we move forward in making sure we look strategic? What does our work look like for us when we're facilitating and working collaboratively with curriculum, with technology, with professional learning, with readiness to learn? and making sure that we have in front of students that's going to make them successful in the uh, education that we're providing for them. How many coaches do we have? We have a coach at every single building. And so basically looking at, I want to say 53 buildings, we have 53 coaches. Do they, do they take on an added level of importance in becoming part of a communication team for us, perhaps? <clears throat> something that we had not identified as part of their job description. Because, that, you know, we're, we're all learning as we go, and mm -hmm. things are changing on the fly. And I'm just trying to figure out how we effectively communicate whether it's, and maybe you don't need coaches, maybe it's the principal's role, but I gotta imagine that as many hands as we can can have that are informed voices in those buildings may be very, mm -hmm. very helpful. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm looking at the things they do, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if that might be something that we add to that job description. I, I think for the most part, it's there within the job description, so coaches is not a standalone or an isolated position, and so the coach's role is definitely there to support yeah. uh, the principal. I think we go back and we even we look at the research of showers and showers, we know that when we have teachers and you're just demonstrating yeah. a lesson, that that research shows that yeah. coaches are very impactful when they're communicating yeah. and working with their principal, the impact that they have on the learning community. So they are key communicators. And again, yeah. that's why it was important, Steve, when the coaches asked, Ramona, do our principals know about this? How much of this have been shared with principals? Yeah. And so sometimes it's, we've kind of gone, it's like the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken, that you're giving me information that you have not shared with principals yet. Yeah, and I, and I see that yeah. number eight button, and maybe it's the fact that it, it's built, it's already hardwired into their job description, but the significance or importance of that responsibility be, maybe becomes heightened um, under, under the current conditions. Well, even like what you're, you're, we are doing things on the fly, and but trying to gather as much information as possible. So, if we're going to if we're going to model remote learning, yeah, we no longer have to gather everyone in one place. So, as we did with the PTA group a week ago last Wednesday, whenever that was, how do we spread that into our buildings and have that happen regularly, or at least quarterly? But how do you also gather? information from all these coaches on a regular basis with input from their principals. Again, we need to be, what we're, what we're trying to figure out here is what is timely 
Mm -hmm. And how soon do we need that information to make adjustments? So we're really looking at uh, COVID update, if you will, on a weekly basis. So how do we get that critical information to us? So as we start sorting from a district level, how's that coming from our building levels? So, you know, I, I will call these things COVID silver linings because it has pushed us to be, I think, more efficient and more purposeful in how do we gain that input and then use it to modify whatever, and like Glennon was, how do you, what are you gonna do with this? What are you gonna, are you gonna modify, da, da, da. And again, I think we have to modify because this is truly unknown. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but and coaches do not teach, right? They just support the teachers. Coaches support the adult learners in the building. But right. they were former teachers, correct? Yes. And, we'll, and if we have uh, classes where we're short subs, are they ever pulled in to help? Because they are experienced and they're sort of the experts training all the others. So we like for the answer to be no, but we definitely know that <laughs> with a shortage of subs. <laughs> so uh, they're that, not exempt last call. from they're, yeah. they're not ex hitting. You're right. right. They're, they're not exempt from that. Okay. So um, again, if we can... Uh, that this also, if we're developing these banks of lessons, we now have access where, or let, let's also understand, we're going to have teachers, administrators, who because of contact tracing will probably not be local, but they can still work remote. But you can't have a class without some type of supervision, so maybe now we're tapping into TAs that can also be that person in the classroom while the teacher is teaching remotely. So we just flipped it. We just flipped it. Instead of the kids being remote, the teacher's remote. But again, that's the kind of creativity we're going to have to think about because I am very concerned about substitutes. Substitutes in the teaching ranks, substitutes on our bus drivers. We need, if that's a call for our general public, that's a critical piece and we need bus drivers, we need food service workers because we are going to need substitutes. So just a call out to the public on that one. But please continue, that's good stuff. Okay, thank you. All right. So, so again with coaches in that virtual world, we again know that just as Dr. Daniel just shared that they need support also. So in order for them to support the adults in the building, we will continue to have coaches engaged in a professional learning community. We will have that engagement through our talent management system and again leveraging um, with our digital platform with Zoom. So again, when we look at a new role for teachers, um, I was sharing with the coordinators the other day, um, I was looking at a, a Twitter account from a superintendent, I do not remember the exact uh, district. <coughs> Uh, the superintendent was asking, someone asked the question of how do we support teachers new this year? How do we support administrators new to the district? And the superintendent's response was, everyone in my district is new this year. Mm -hmm. Every administrator is new, every teacher is new, every support staff person is new, because I'm dealing with something as an, admin, as an administrator I'm dealing with someone as the direction setter in my district that we have not had to deal with this new normal or the pandemic. So for each one of us, this slide says a new role for teachers, but this slide really speaks to each and every one of us that how in our roles do we act as activators of learning? So we know that we're gonna to have to make sure that we have challenging learning goals and how do we make sure that we're having adult learners as well as student learners engaged how do we make sure that we're giving them the access that they need to pedagogical practices? And then of course that ongoing feedback. So exactly that as Mr. Corona asked, how do we make sure that we're engaging in that cycle of continuous improvement and that we're really seeking the feedback that we need to make sure that we're making the adjustments that's necessary along the way. Culture building is in the middle because that is so important. We have to make sure that we have those norms of trust that we're actually making sure that we're implementing within the learning community. Students' voice is so important, especially in deep learning, because we want them to be co-designers in the work. And then how do we cultivate that learning environment? 
Collaboration when it comes back to our coaches being key communicators, our building principals, when we look at our PPLCs, when we look at our leadership uh, communities throughout the district, we want to make sure what is it that we're looking at and how we're assessing, how we're connecting the students, families, and the community, how we're always engaged in that collaborative inquiry piece, and definitely going back to that last bullet, it focuses on that clarity around deep learning. How do we make sure that we're building and sharing knowledge of deep learning throughout the district so that we can move to the depth phase and eventually make sure that we have what we need to make sure that we're sustaining uh, deep learning throughout the district. This is a quote that I like. It's one that Jack Bird uses all the time when it comes to deep learning. And so we know that what's good at learning is good at life. And we know that using deep learning and the strategies of deep learning will help not only our students to be successful, but it will help our adults to be successful. Any additional questions? So um, we make a promise to the, to the state that we will have operate a 180 day school year each day is what 330 minutes or what what's the <coughs> the minutes in a school day are we required to have so many minutes of instructional time yes tracy for instructional time for, at the state level so many minutes the required minutes the of instruction it, if it's six times 55 that's 330 but i'm not yeah. sure five to six hours so 300 360. okay so I guess where I'm leading uh, going with this is that uh, in the slide that you talked about with synchronous and asynchronous learning, do we only get credit for synchronous learning time? We're given no. both. 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 Okay. And there's no balance or minimal synchronous learning time? Okay. No, very mm -hmm. flexible. Can I Again, mm -hmm. students engaged could be offline which is fine because we're trying to create ultimately independent learners. Okay. But to do that, it takes a planned system to mm -hmm. move students to that level of independence. Okay. So, so if, we, if we hit those students face to face in our classroom and we're facilitating instruction for 10 minutes or chunking that information that we're giving to students. So again, if I had them face to face, I'm facilitating the learning for the students. And then independently, I'm stepping back and I'm letting the students apply the learning that I just facilitated with them. So, so don't they ask for proof for asynchronous learning? And, and what proof do we have? I mean, are they going to take us for, at our word that, that the, our students spend X percent of yep. their school day? Yes, um, they, they, there, there will not be a, we're trying to create a mechanism through, through our system that we yeah. can say that students were in attendance. Yeah. But again, if they're remote, I, I will say this though, because I've experienced blended learning, I've experienced where I've had juniors and seniors in a classroom for two days or three days a week. The other time they're either at home or they're in the building right. in a particular like the IMC. The data showed that, and this, this came from teachers, that mastery increased the more independence we gave the student. Okay. And I think that's the ultimate goal here. How do we create independent learners? And back to Tom's thought, especially as they transition from high school to whatever their next level of learning is. So with the computer that Jack Bird just gave them, they're going to log into <laughs> our learning management system, right? And Correct. Yeah. Will we be able to actually track that time as a... I'll defer to Jack on that one. <laughs> so, I mean, do we... Do we do we want to or have the ability to track that time that they've logged down? Well, I don't know if we can, Jack. You want to speak to that? I, I will say this though: a lot of manipulations can take place around sure. that thought. The proof is going to be in their mastery of that particular content. Okay. That will be the proof. Mm -hmm. So if you if you want to play the you know because every time you create a barrier. It's amazing how students are creative finding a way around that barrier, sure. whether it be cyber security or what have you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with that said, we have to figure out the, what is the ultimate, assess, the ultimate assessment is, have they mastered their learning? Yeah. But go ahead, answer that. Do you, can we track that? Yes, we, we, yeah. we know the amount of time that they have spent okay. um, on the LMS. 
Well, I, I once yeah. had the pleasure of experiencing an online driving course for <laughs> certain activities that I had engaged in. And um, every, every once in a while I was asked to prove my identity yeah, yeah, to make yeah. sure that I was actually there. actively involved. Yeah. yeah. I still have my license, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Any qu more questions? I mean, what Ramona has been doing is huge as yeah. far as li that's a huge lift. And as you've heard me say, I think truly the foundation is there now. Now we're into the stage of not just clarity, but now let's implement. Mm -hmm. So our focus is about implementation. How do we use our directors? How do we use our coaches? How do we support building level? staff, both principals, administrators, as well as teachers. So I think the, you know, kudos to all your work that you've done you. and I'm very excited. I, I would like to get into classrooms. I've met with all the high school principals. I think they're thinking I won't be there, but I will try to get into classrooms because I want to see this in action and I want to reinforce it. Same with our cabinet and same with our directors. So there may be a little shift in that, that's more to come at a later date, but thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to, I like to call this the operation side, the nuts and bolts, which I can really understand this, and it's very, it's more tactical. So go ahead, Kathy. All right. <laughs> um, first of all, we'll talk about cleaning procedures, and um, if you go to the next slide. Um, we were, you know, as you know, we're partnering with Sodexo to make sure that we have um, uh, clean facilities. Maintenance and operations in the schools will be working with Sodexo to make sure that we have clean areas for our students. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't think that microphone's working too well. That's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start over again. That's right. Um, uh, so, as you know, we're partnering with Sodexo and our maintenance and operations department works very closely with them to make sure that we are providing a clean environment for our students and our teachers. And um, they have got some procedures in place that aren't typical for um, uh, classroom cleaning and so forth. They're, they're adding extra steps. They're making sure that we're hitting high touch areas to make sure that um, everything is uh, safer for the students. Um, we are using products that are EPA approved um, for use against the virus, so that will be helpful also. And um, we are, this is something new this year, we're going to have product available in each classroom for periodic cleaning of frequently touched surfaces. So there will be a bottle in the room with paper towels. Um, the desks can be cleaned in between students. Um, and uh, I know in some of the uh, class lists that, that students have been asked to purchase items for um, school, they've asked for um, parents to buy wipes, um, and we are not providing wipes in the classroom. Frankly, they're hard to find for one thing, um, but if parents do, um, um, are able to find wipes and they want to provide them um, for their students' area, um, they are welcome to do that. If they can't find them, know that we have this as an alternative, um, these uh, cleaning products and paper towels for the students. Um, and along, I, I'll, I'll reinforce, you know, we talked earlier about the Sodexo contract and that they're providing uh, nighttime supervision. Again, that is to make sure that um, they're, they're monitoring the work of the custodians to make sure that uh, we have clean areas for the students. Um, there's also environmental considerations. Um, uh, so um, indoor air quality is something that we are always concerned about. As you know, we have an indoor air quality policy. Um, but one of the, the things that we can do um, and our facilities teams, our facilities team facilitates this and that's making sure that our ventilation systems are thoroughly checked and then they're adjusted for air exchanges. And this is all computerized so that they can uh, monitor this. Um, they will also make sure that all air filters, filters are changed and they'll be checked every 60 days. Um, and unfortunately, as you know, we do have some buildings that still don't have air conditioning. Um, we have five buildings, um, and that is going to be a concern with people wearing masks and so forth. So um, we have uh, worked with buildings to identify areas if people do need relief where they could go in an area. There are air-conditioned spaces in every building, even though the entire buildings aren't air-conditioned. 
where they can go and get some relief. And we also will be providing fans to assist in the ventilation. So um, we're gonna do all that we can to make sure that the, the, the air quality is good. Um, and and it, folks need to follow our normal um, indoor air quality policies as well. Kathy, do I understand that those five buildings will be air conditioned they by will. What, the end of 2022? Uh, uh, no, I imagine 23 is what I'm guessing. Oh, 20, 23. Uh, Darren's giving me the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we're fortunate though that our community approved that. Um, otherwise, uh, we would not have that, that done by that time. So um, next I'll go into the uh, personal protective equipment and I'll start with masks and shields. And just to sort of put this in perspective, we are expecting to buy probably 4 million masks by the, by the end of the year. Wow. Um, part of that's gonna depend on who, um, what choices families are making. But, um, and then for shields, at the, at the moment we've purchased 3,200 shields. Um, I'm not sure if we'll need to purchase more of those at this point. Um, and as been stated already, students will be provided a mask daily. Um, and they'll get that either on the school bus or they'll get it when they get to school. We also will allow students to bring their own mask if they choose to do that. Um, we just wanna stress that they should be cleaned often every day, they should have a clean mask on. Um, employees are responsible to provide their own mask. Um, and as far as the face shields are concerned, um, they are being provided to all teachers and then certain other employees. And um, some of those employees would be um, classroom assistants, um, special ed assistants, ELL assistants, um, administrators who might have close contact, like a, a counselor um, speaking to a student. Um, so we've we've tried to capture all those positions. Um, again, this this may be a play out um, as we go, but at the moment, I feel like we've um, we're we're doing a, a good thing here for our teachers to help them be able to. Um, show their face to their students. One of the things that came up at first is like all K through two teachers should have one so that they can do phonics with the students and they can see their mouth. So then it, it kind of led, one thing led to another and it was determined that really all teachers. Now when they're not, mouth doesn't need to be seen, really with these shields they're supposed to continue to wear a mask even though they have the shield on. Um, as far as sanitizer is concerned, we are purchasing the approved um, CDC approved sanitizer. Um, the CDC requires a 60% alcohol based. Ours is going to be a 70% alcohol based that we have. There will be a container in every single classroom and those will be refilled in the evenings by Sodexo or whenever they need to be refilled. Um, there will also be bottles in the offices and there will be stands um, in common areas where people could uh, also get sanitizer that way. Again, this is another item that was on the supply list um, for the students. And um, I'm guessing more likely families would buy, you know, small personal uh, sanitizer if they can find those. Um, but they should know if they're unable to get those for their individual student, they will be available um, in every classroom and we um, are purchasing quite a bit of, of that. And, and so you know, in, in both of these categories, the state does have a program too to help support schools. And we have asked, um, uh, we have said that we would like to participate in that. They're providing one cloth mask um, times the number of students you have. I'm not sure at this point how those will be distributed. We don't have them yet. Um, and sanitizer, they're providing an equal amount of gallons to every single school district in the state. So <laughs> it's not a lot for us, but it is um, some, some sanitizer that the state has provided. So we'll welcome those things. Um, and then in terms of student meals, a different subject now, but moving on to a different um, topic here. Breakfasts um, and, and lunches, of course, will be provided to those that are at school, but they'll be done differently. Breakfast will be picked up on the way into the school and eaten in the classroom. And that's, that's how it's done right now in elementary schools, but this will be done in secondary schools as well now. Um, lunches, um, in the elementary, they'll be delivered near the classrooms and eaten in the classroom. In secondary, the students will go to the cafeteria, pick their lunch up, but then take it back to the classroom and eat it there. Um, if they are choosing the blended model, um, what we are going to attempt to do here is to provide, provide them a meal to take home with them for the next day. And those will be packaged up and if they ride the bus, they will be on the bus. And 
we we want to say uh, you know to our students and and our parents we really need them to take care that those are not opened up on the bus that they get those all the way home they will be often foods that can be heated up they're, they're, I'm told they will not be necessarily appetizing on the bus because it's it's product that can be taken home and heated up um, for them so, so it could be frozen meals from time to time so that um, they they would take those home and, and heat them the next day um, so they need to go home and be refrigerated and then then they can be cooked those that choose complete remote learning we will have a weekly distribution of five sets of meals breakfast and lunch that parents will pick up and we have not determined what that day will be yet we're working on that um, and that will begin the second week of school so not the 13th of um, August it'll it'll start the week after that um, so we want to we want to find a way to provide food to every student um, but it, it'll be different this year and, and, and it, particularly those that are choosing remote or um, have a blended schedule it, it's going to be a little bit different than normal obviously um, what is not included on here but I'll say it here since it's it's uh, you drink it as water um, we did not have we don't have that on the slide but as um, dr. Daniel mentioned um, the drinking fountains will be off and we do have bottle fillers though that will be on which are in the same structure as the as the uh, drinking fountains but students are being asked to bring their own water bottle um, and that's really important so that they can um, have something to drink during the day since they won't have access to the drinking fountain so I just want to say in part parting here um, hats off to all the behind the scene people that are making sure that uh, school will go on and and be safe for our students Thank any you. questions okay. next slide. oh yeah there you go nice. so all of this information again there's an extensive list on FAQs on our website page so we're asking parents to go there for that information it's being added to every day um, perhaps even modified some of the current information we also will have soon the whole return to learn plan in a booklet type format um, and that should be in the next day or so so it gives me another chance to touch base with all the teachers and all of our parents actually and students so um, plan on doing that July 29th is huge please register whether you're remote or whether or not you're going in person so um, those are that that's your update in regards to what happened to return um, and to learn so I think we're in a good position um, I think we're being covering the training for our staff and our teachers and uh, we'll continue to listen to the input of our constituents um, I do have a question I you know, Kathy explained very well the procedures for the um, safety of our students obviously you thought this out very well um, sounds like we're going to have clean clean buildings um, very safe buildings with our masks and the hand sanitizer and all those things but I guess my question that um, parents are concerned about if we would have a COVID case what are the procedures for that so just today we're sent some more information from the Indiana Department of Health and there are specific procedures in place if Mary was here tonight and she apologizes she's a new grandmother Aww. and she's there today so that's why she's not here we are so fortunate to have Mary Hess she works so closely with the county health department we have protocols in place where algorithms exist if this situation there you follow the flow if this happens if this happens we have numerous scenarios that have been generated however we know there will be an infinite number of scenarios so therefore the guidelines are somewhat being modified for instance at one time it was 72 hours now it's down to 24 hours but I just want to say privacy is at most important so there will be no sharing of names of people who are perhaps infected however there will be 10 to 14 days of either quarantine or isolation that will be the question when that starts to happen because I truly believe it's not a matter of if it's when when that begins to happen how's that impact 
each individual school. Mm -hmm. Because we will look at it on an individual school basis, site basis. That will then drive eventually if you have, if, if it permeates into many other buildings, then you have the decision how many is too many? And when do, then do you go entirely remote? So we are very serious about remote training and handing those computers to our students as quickly as possible because we want to have that time to train. Yes, our teachers, but our teachers then to train our students on how to utilize remote learning. We cannot go back to last spring. All across our country, we stopped learning, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, you, you can look at all the data, and that's basically what happened. Mm -hmm. So with that, we cannot go back there again. You're going to find if we do that, we're going to have generations of lost time in educating our kids. We can't continue doing that. So very serious about the remote learning piece and very serious about the safety piece. Mm -hmm. um, and safety does trump everything. Right. So. Yeah, and, uh, when we had that Zoom meeting you were mentioning before with the PTA and some parents and things, Kathy had mentioned in the breakoff groups that, you know, parents are crucial this time for, for yes. being supportive of the district, making sure their students follow the guidelines with the masks and cleanliness and that type of thing. And we really, really need parent support right now. More than ever, ever. we need parents to back us. Um, to be supportive of what we're establishing in each classroom. So I hope our parents um, yeah, thank you know, you for that. Yes. continue to su support us and, in, and reinforce what we're telling our students at home, to, you know, to follow those same guidelines and be safe. And it's the only way we're going to be safe yeah. as a district. Okay. Board member comments? Steve? Well, um, as long as we're flexible um, yeah. and that we start with a sound, strong principles and ideas as to what we need to do when when we when something happens, um, I think we'll be okay. I mean, it's you know we're this is, we're going to have to also be play some of this by ear. It's we don't have all the answers to every scenario, but right. um, I'm pleased with what I heard this evening. I would make one suggestion, and that is, um, as I was listening to the presentation this evening, uh, if there is, maybe you've given this some thought already, but a, a, a video or a visual to this, and I was likening this to um, the instructions that airlines give you with respect to the onboarding process. Many years ago, they, you know, a flight attendant would mumble something over a phone, but now the airlines have a video that clearly demonstrate, visually demonstrate everything that you need to be aware of. And um, that might be helpful for visual learners to see pictures of what we've described in this PowerPoint. I just want to commend you and your staff for all the hard work that you devoted to um, trying to uh, wrap your heads around this un these unusual circumstances. And um, again, like Steve, I like what I heard. I feel like you've really thought things through. Um, I just and I uh, want to commend the teachers because obviously they're going to be the ones in the classrooms and they're the ones that are also going to be uh, at risk because um, that's where the learning takes place. Uh, teachers have, have always been on the front lines. It doesn't matter if it was a pandemic or if it's the flu, if it's the flu or um, some other colds or whatever it is that's passing through society at the time. They've always had you know, take those risks. So I just want to thank the teachers for their dedication, not only to learning, but to, to the, to the, their students, because they are, they are definitely going to be taking a risk, but it can be done safely if we all work together. 
And I just want to remind people that in, there have been numerous countries that have already opened up their schools and they have not seen a major surge. So a few of them have, but in general, a lot of the countries that have opened up have been able to do so safely. And I feel like we're taking those precautions and those steps in order to be able to do the same thing here in America, at least hopefully here in Allen County. And um, the just want to point out, parents have a, are are doing the best they can with the information they've got to safeguard their families, and and they need to do that, and they need to be diligent about that. But if you are under the age of 60, then COVID-19 is less deadly than influenza, and I heard that today at a press conference by American um, frontline doctors who were holding a press conference in the Supreme in front of the Supreme Court and it was not part of the news and as well as from other physicians and pediatricians who who uh, when interviewed said they would send their kids back to school without hesitation because kids are less susceptible um, of getting this uh, disease and or passing it on which is I thought interesting I don't know how you uh, figured that out but they have according to the science and that um, nationwide we have had 30 deaths of children 15 and under so just to give a little perspective that we're not going to hear because uh, the news has been highly sensationalized about the facts around this virus initially uh, when we knew nothing about a brand new virus, the safeguards and the steps that we took were warranted. Now we know a whole, whole lot more. It's a whole lot less deadly than originally thought. And we have learned a lot about the Working at Fort Wayne Community Schools, both in the administration and the teachers out there and all the people who are helping to make this work. Because this is going to be <laughs> a heck of an experience, an experiment as well. And I just think that we're off to a great start and I uh, can't wait for kids to get back in school. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for all that you've done. Uh, you know, what, what you have done normally should take at least a year to learn and to implement and to figure everything out. And you guys have done it in warp speed. So, and you're still trying to figure everything out. And but I do trust in, in you guys that um, you know we're going to be off to a great start when when uh, August whatever 13th for now rolls mm -hmm. around. Yep. That's right. um, so thank you for all your hard work. Um, will I just have a, qu a question? Will the this, I know the YouTube obviously will have this board meeting um, that parents can rewatch if they didn't get to see it tonight. But will the um, PowerPoint also be on our website as well? Yes. Okay. And maybe that's all I had. Oh, and um, will Mary Hess be at our next board meeting? With that, I think that would be. Yes, we helpful. we plan on having Mary. She's uh, in every now every weekly cabinet meeting with us as well. So okay. she's a vital part of our team. So. Yeah, I think parents would like to hear yep. from her. So that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Um, I just want to uh, thank the cabinet and the, all the directors. I know that this was a lot to put together. Um, and also the principals um, for doing the drive-through registrations um, and everybody that they pulled together to be able to do those um, events. So thank you so much. Um, and I just want to echo a comment that Ramona made. Um, she said that everyone is a new employee in the pandemic. Um, and so I know that I mentioned it before um, about giving each other grace. Mm. Um, this is our first worldwide pandemic. Mm. And uh, I think that uh, we need to offer everyone grace and we need to be flexible. Um, I was reading some of the comments on the YouTube feed and there are lots of questions still. And I would encourage uh, parents and families to reach out to their principals, 
uh, read the frequently asked question page, um, like uh, Dr. Daniels mentioned, that FAQ page is being updated frequently. And so we, we hear your questions, we hear your concerns, and we're going to get you answers to those. Um, so please just sit tight and, and again, offer each other grace. Um, and like Ann mentioned, um, we're all a family, we're all the FWCS family, and we're all the Fort Wayne community, um, and just want to make sure that we take care of each other. So if those parents could encourage other students, their students, to keep masks on on the bus and adhere to the rules and policies that are being set up to keep everyone safe. Um, and so, and just wanted to say welcome to Raleigh Booker. Thanks. <laughs> Julie, if I could just ask, uh, make a comment and ask sure. a question of Dr. Daniel. I know that uh, the pushback of the start of the school year by three days is appreciated, but I know that some of us heard uh, requests to either start school in September or uh, to go virtual learning for an extended period of time. And what was the discussion uh, with your team about so, those options? We know we have to train our teachers and our students in remote learning. For them to end, we have to have the equipment available for our students if we were to go remote. So the idea is start, as, start, start with proper training. Let's have those in hand in case something happens because of uh, state guidelines that say you can't, everyone's going to remote. So, we were very aware of thinking, well, if we would go to, say, after Labor Day. But again, we have the training, we were ready to go, let's do this. And we have the PPE in place. We think we've covered the safety issue. Um, we're still uncertain entirely how we're going to create safe distancing in every classroom. But we know we've figured it out from the secondary world. The elementary world's a a guess because it depends how many parents will do remote. Um, the numbers are trending actually um, more favorable for enabling us to create distance learning in the elementary. And I think the elementary teachers need to hear, need to hear that. Yeah. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, but again, we'll know after the 29th. But that was the primary reason. Let's get it going because if we don't and we don't have this if we don't have this in place, we, we will lose kids for another X number of months to a year. And we just can't afford that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Dr. Daniel, just a I, comment. I, no, I, again, I'm, th this is, <laughs> actually work is very exciting every day because <laughs> it is brand new. It's like, what's on the agenda today? No, but these people, I'll tell you, they have come through any time I've asked. I'm very, it's been very, <laughs> very rewarding. Um, and we know, uh, I, I just want to reiterate what Maria said, we have to give grace because this is so new and so, um, so very different. And it will not be done perfectly, and we're going to have hip cups, and that's okay. Um, that's also taking, that means we're taking risk and doing something we've never done. And I'm hoping, as I've told, as I've spoken to new teachers and new administrators, actually new teachers will be tomorrow some. <laughs> there are silver linings to COVID-19. We will figure out those silver linings. And there are things that are going to happen that we probably would not have done. I know we would not have done, such as remote learning, such as pre-recording of lessons, such as, and let's just go down the list. I, I will just say those things are important. Um, and I, with that frame of mind, that mindset, I think we'll be able to continue or truly create a new learning experience that's very meaningful, but also do it in a very safe way. So. Um, thank you, Maria, for the, reminding us. And parents, teachers, staff, if you're feeling ill, you stay home. That's the key. You stay home. And then we go through our nurses to decipher what that illness is. And it may mean we need isolation or quarantine. That's okay. And no one's pointing fingers at anyone. It's 
give everyone grace during this time period. So um, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, and I think we're really modeling grace by the grace period that has been uh, built in. And right. I really um, like that. Uh, I think that it is important to uh, start, you know, on August 13th just to get uh, devices and uh, MiFi's and everything in the hands of kids. And then um, parents have those three weeks to decide if they have really made the right choice for their family. Um, so I really like that. And uh, like everyone else, I just want to thank you, Dr. Daniel, and, and everyone that's here tonight. And, uh, QIT teams and coaches and um, everybody that's you know been working hard um, to uh, get ready for what's I'm sure going to be to prove to be a very um, interesting school year a school year like no other <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and just a reminder that we meet next on August 10th and that meeting will be open to the public, yes. uh, mass required, subject to social distancing uh, guidelines. And uh, at that time, we will be joined by our new colleague, um, Raleigh Booker. Um, and we'll get ready to start school on the 13th. So, exciting time. Do we have a motion for adjournment? Before we do that, okay. just two additional comments um, or three. First of all, Dr. Daniel, uh, welcome to Fort Wayne, 27 days in. Little did you know that the deep end of the pool was very deep. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Darren Hiss and his team for something um, that was brought to our attention earlier this year when we were visiting uh, neighborhood associations um, there was a comment made, made to me and Heather Krebs about barbed wire protecting some uh, equipment at Fairfield School. Darren's team took a look at it and decided they no longer needed that barbed wire uh, and had it recently removed. And so uh, we listened to our parents and I know that they will appreciate that. Um, I noticed in the newspaper this Sunday um, that we, there's a little bit of competition involving Anthem, uh, PHP, and Parkview Hospital. And I don't know if we're going to get to a solution, Charles, but uh, I know the deadline is just a couple of days away. Is there a plan B? Because I know if there's no resolution, <coughs> so many of our employees are going to be out of network. Right. And I know we don't want that to happen. Any update as to whether they're smoking a peace pipe yet? No, they're not, but they're still smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so that his comment was, no, they're not, but they're still smoking. Okay. <laughs> so, um, it's tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. it's 11.59 it's, it's tomorrow. Uh, I've heard from both parties. They are still talking. And uh, we, we have a plan B. And we will not have our people out of network okay. paying additional costs. Thank you. It's good news. Good Great. News. Thanks, Charles. Okay, do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? We're out of here. All right. That's fine.